Thanks, Michael, and good morning, everybody. Very conscious of coming between you and your lunch um, and talking about books at the same time. So try and be swift. Um, it's also just as a parenthesis to what Michael was just saying, worth reminding everybody that in this world of books, in the arts and social sciences, no publisher, no publisher, including arguably the leading e-book provider in institutional context, is Taylor and Francis, reports more than 25% of e-sales as a proportion of the whole. 75% print is the number for the largest. And for the American University Press sector, it's still about 90%, 10%. Just got to emphasize that this is still, despite everything Mike was saying, a very, very, very largely print-driven world, which sends no signs of going away. So you need to factor that in to thinking about all of this as we go forward. Getting books to library, as Michael was mentioned. Now, I was talking about retail. Older delegates may remember strange things called academic bookshops that we used to have. There's a very good one around the corner, Dylan's, um, which is, to be honest, not quite what it used to be, partly because Waterstones, its parents, no longer see themselves as an academic bookseller in any meaningful sense. Nonetheless, retail remains an important part, an often underarticulated part, of the academic book proposition. Those of you who saw on the kitchen a couple of years ago the work that Joe Esposito and others have done, looking at, say, the University of Chicago Press, may recall that 50% of Chicago's monographic sales, not their trade sales, their monographic sales, were still through retail outlets of one kind or another. So it's important to remember this is not just, absolutely not just, a conversation about libraries. So the print channels, though, as Michael's explored, remain vital to most publishers across a gamut of types and sizes. Agencies. Now, through print, obviously, as Michael's hinted, the determinant change agent by a mile, the most important single factor, has been Amazon. I always say that without Amazon, CUP, where I worked for 30 odd years, lacked his MD, CUP would have ceased to exist. And that's very true for many, I think, specialist presses, because Amazon not least revalorized the monograph, which is a very important part of their proposition. We have here this question at the bottom about publisher to read a direct sales. People often say, in terms of intermediaries, why are there not more direct sales between publishers and readers? Actually, there are very, very few. Many people have often commented how rubbish publishers' e-commerce sites are because they're not basically not nearly as good as Amazon's or anybody, any other major e-player. But it remains a very, very small part of what publishers do. You'll see, you often see, for example, the coverage given to publishers like, say, Yale, who are trustee, Princeton, Harvard, Profile, others who operate on the cusp, if you like, of the academic scholarly posh trade end. And for them, this is a hugely important agenda. How can we maintain the presence and supply of academic books for retail purchase at a time when not his space in bookstores for this stuff is declining? Now, as Michael's hinted, this is fundamental. The supply chain for books is inherently more complex than for journals. And the most fundamental reason is one of size. There are far, far, far more books published every year than journals. Simple as that. There are about, I mean, BNT Gobi suggests they get about 70,000 new things to catalogue each year in the arts and social sciences. Okay, 70,000 things each year. There are between 28 to 30,000 journals people record in the world. So you think about that in terms of a basic proposition. And these obviously generate supply chains inherently more complex than those for journals. The level of intermediaries remains much greater, I mentioned. Fundamental fact, the elephant in the, in the room absolutely is the continued dominance of print. Absence of subscription models in many cases. Sales of individual titles remaining massively important at every possible level. I think volume of titles, I mean, both by imprint and overall. And of course, likewise, the low volume of sales per title. This stat is often overdone, or at least kind of over-articulated, over but nonetheless, it's absolutely true on a continuum getting back over 30 to 40 years. And then, again, this key thing, the lack of the sort of abstract and indexing services that many of you working in serials are used to. Most books, until recently, had absolutely no chapter metadata of any kind. Persuading people to provide chapter metadata remains, as any publisher will tell you, an uphill struggle, to put it politely. But many publishers have now incorporated that in their workflow, workflow systems with greater or less success. Publishing. Now, this is a little question to prove you're all still awake. Any idea how many different publishers British historians used in their last research excellent framework exercise? Any idea? Anybody from the audience like to guess how many different imprints were used by British historians at the last ref? Any suggestions? Want to have a go? What was that, 15? Something? 50? Any? Sorry? 
very good, 215 different publishers were used simply by British historians for the Lars Research, excellent framework, a piece of stat I'm very grateful to Michael and his colleagues for. There's a huge gamut of imprints, all trying to do ultimately the same things as OEP or TNF or CEP or whatever, many of which are very, very small, very small margin, you know, and but constituting a significant part of the overall sales revenue and obviously publishing activity in this sector. Obviously for Springer, Elsevier, whoever, academic books are a relatively small part of their business, but there are huge numbers, robustly small, undercapitalized players, many of whom just can't afford the metadata proposition that Michael was talking about. There have been a wave of consolidations, but at the same time there reigns this huge armory of smaller imprints of one sort or another. Again, whose relationship with Amazon is often determinant for their success or failure. Now, book publishing is much more variegated, much more fragmented, it's much more multilingual, very importantly, of course, than journal publishing. Intermediaries are vital in the supply chain. Intermediaries, just so you know, take anything from between 25 to 50 percent of the revenues from that value chain, so it's a very significant part indeed of the overall economic landscape of book publishing, often one not very well articulated, often not very well understood. And the next point, that vitality, but then what are they actually contributing to that 25 to 50% is, you know, fairly by many people increasingly being questioned. Michael mentioned the key fact of speed and how Amazon changed the rules of engagement. These questions of discoverability, demand, access, and indeed sales, all closely interlinked, but not working well enough to, to maximize impact at the present, and that's a big agenda going forward. In terms of impact, it's also worth saying, out of that 70,000, 0.1%, basically, were currently made available primarily in an open access form. Open access book publishing constitutes, um, the, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Gobi reckon about 0.1%, a thousandth of overall global academic book production in the arts and social sciences. So there is some way to go for that to become a mainstream scholarly activity. Declining sales per monograph in both print and electronic forms linked, as we've explored, to declining title marketing. Number of, obviously, the number of titles published annually has gone up significantly. Amount of marketing has declined overall, and particularly, as Michael said, on new titles. The strong faculty preference for print is a massive barrier, remains so, and I hear every year about generational change, we'll, we'll change this, generational change will transform this. That's a message I've heard for 20 years, right? We actually haven't come very far in these kind of conversations, and I remain very skeptical. The implications of that for everybody involved, whether it's for libraries, publishers, intermediaries, is that we're all going to be running a duplicate print e cost base for, I reckon, certainly my lifetime, at least 25 to 30, 40 years more. Anybody thinks otherwise, I think it's massively delusional. We'll see. Now, what new techniques or agencies, and I'm sure you'll want to turn to this in conversation, would most enhance readership and access? both sustainably and also, secondly, at scale. And scale is the key to this. One of the challenges is this is an industrial landscape, okay? It's, in, it's an industrial landscape frequented by many artisanal businesses, if that's not a paradox, and that's one of the challenges for it, I think, overall. I think that's all Michael and I wanted to say, consciousness, but just setting up a series of questions for you around the massively important issue of the supply chain for books, because I would, again, just gently remind everyone at the end that, of course, Tenured faculty in the arts and social sciences are actually the majoritarian cohort in the British university system. Worth reminding everybody here that science, ironically, as a proportion of British tenured faculty, has been in decline since 1967, which is a fact I just leave you with now in the context of this discussion. Many thanks.